What's up? How you doing? Here we are. Beautiful evening. Beautiful evening tonight. Tuesday. Um, end of July 2024. So, I have a... I know I've shown this before, but... Fireman's Axe. Small one. Everybody should have one of these in their motor car. You never know. You never know when you need to get into something or there's an emergency. Maybe you have to get somebody out of something. This thing is solid stuff. Good hickory handle. Um, two pounds. But if you swing this, it's devastating. So Plus it has the back. Little uh, sharp point there on the back. It'll break through most things, including concrete. Up there and then I found my SOG SOG knife I love this knife I'm a big fan the, the tangles all the way through solid steel good craftsmanship on this it comes with a, uh, a sharpening stone in case you have to sharpen it all right, nice leather sheath, very sharp, um, so this is a SOG, very, very um, intense point, if you could see that point, but very sharp. But the, the point is extremely sharp, and uh, fits well in your palm I know there's a joke in there somewhere but um, so I bought this I bought this probably uh, like nine ten years ago and uh, you know I, I really like it it's a good uh, my father years ago when we would go fishing he had a I think it was a cast a knife made by Cass, and uh, he he would use it to cut the worms for bait <clears throat> when we went fishing. But it had a similar similar look, although his was uh, shiny and it was a little bit thinner. This is a uh, very thick, thick steel. So, good knife. Big fan of this. Yeah, that's sharp. I think it looks like a big piece of gum. Put that over here. Have my shoe shining uh, tools. Right there. My measure. Reminds me of Grover. I think there's a... Uh, a book where Grover has one of these. Grover from Sesame Street. <coughs> so, I have my boots here. These are made by Georgia Boot Company. And uh, I've had these, these are about, I don't know, I want to say five six years old maybe maybe seven they took a while to break in I, I wore them everywhere I, I've uh, hiked in the desert with these and they have the heel in the back so when you're going downhill it helps stabilize I used to be a sneaker guy always wearing I don't wear sneakers now if I do it's once in a uh, not even a blue moon, probably once in a, a beige Jupiter. I don't wear them that often. I, I, I find them to not be supportive, you know, in terms of long hikes. And these are heavy duty. They're kind of heavy on weight too, but I, I like them. But you know, Georgia makes good boots.
I was watching Bill Maher and he was interviewing Penn Jolette, who I met many times. When I say many, I probably like four times. You only meet somebody once and then after you you see them. I mean, I have friends, every time I see them, I don't meet them. I don't say I've met this person 8,500 times. But anyway, he had him on the show and he was, uh, yeah, that podcast he does. And I never, I never knew Bill Maher was so gullible. But now on a few occasions I've seen things that, gullible guy. And I guess we all are depending on what the subject is, right? I mean, anybody can fool anybody if the person you're fooling is not an expert in that topic. But Bill Mark, I don't know, very gullible. Um, you know, he was asking Penn Gillette, he said he saw some guy who, I guess, was doing some mind-reading trick, and Bill Maher... I guess Bill Maher's only explanation to how it was done was some kind of, I don't want to say supernatural uh, ability, but some kind of supernatural ability. And <clears throat> and he was asking Penn what other explanation could there be. And, you know, and Penn was basically saying that when you don't know something, just say, I don't know how it's done. Don't try and attribute that to the supernatural or some other whatever. You know, just say, I don't know. I don't know how it's done. And then when you find out, you can say, this is how it's done. But Bill Maher was jumping to that conclusion, like, how is it possible that this guy was doing this, guessing so accurately? You know, I, I don't know if the guy guessed somebody's uh, boyfriend, girlfriend's name, or whatever he did. But And I was watching it, I go, this, this guy is very naive, very gullible. These are all tricks. It's the same thing with magic, you know, when you don't know how the magic is done, you think that it happened a different way. <laughs> Maybe uh, supernatural or some, some other way. And then once they show you, you're disappointed. You're like, oh, that's how it goes. That's not, not that impressive once they... I've seen many, many magic tricks that are very impressive to me when I first see them. And then when I find out how they're done, I'm disappointed. Because, I don't know, you go, that's how they did it. It's not that impressive anymore when you know. But you want to know because you're curious. And the same thing with this nonsense of reading people's mind. They're not reading your mind. I was part of a small little um, show once where the, the magician, whatever you want to call him, the mind reader, was able to read my mind, but he wasn't reading my mind. It's a trick, and I know how the trick was done. So if you're Bill Maher though, maybe you would look at that and not be able to understand how it was done. You would come up with some ridiculous explanation instead of saying, I don't know. Believe me, rule of thumb, those kind of things always have a logical explanation, always, always. Uh, whether it's a ghost that you think the house is haunted because you hear something or whatever, there's always a logical explanation, and the explanation is never it's a ghost. So, <clears throat> I was part of a, a mind-reading magic trick, and to the audience that didn't know how it was done, it was very impressive. It was like, how did he guess that? The magician. How did he guess that? But I knew how, how the trick was done. And so to me, it wasn't impressive at all. And I'm not going to explain the trick because, uh, you know, I'm not into explaining magic tricks for somebody who makes their living doing that. Let them make their living and entertain you. I'm not gonna expose it, but there are many ways that uh, the reading mind trick goes. There's not just one explanation. Depending on the trick and the magician, there's many, many ways. I've, I've seen David Blaine do it. And I know how he does it. And once you know how it's done, it's not impressive. Now, somebody was asking me uh, five, six months ago about David Blaine. How does he do that that uh, magic trick where he he knows a name of the ex that you're thinking? 
an ex-boyfriend, an ex-girlfriend, whatever. And I said, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to explain it to you and only you. I'm not going to get on the internet and explain it. And I explained it to him. And once I told him, he was like, oh, that's how it's done? I go, yeah, that's how it's done. It's not really him reading your mind. And he was asking, Bill Maher was asking about ghosts. Every single ghost story that I've seen, especially when you get to analyze the details, always has a logical explanation, always. And if you just hear something that somebody told you and there's no way of checking up on it, usually whoever originated the story, whoever made the story up, made it up, made it up. Um, Houdini was great at exposing the fake uh, nonsense when it came to psychics and seances and all that stuff, Ouija boards, all that stuff's fake. I know people get disappointed when they hear that, or they'll point to somebody that guessed something accurately and they say, well, explain that. I can guess things accurately, accurately too once in a while. You know, they say that, you know, anybody can be right 2% of the time on guessing things that are going to happen. If you know a little bit of history and you just repeat in general things, vague things, or even specific things, if you repeat enough specific things that will happen in the future, 2% of those things may turn out to be true in certain people. And then those certain people will point to you and say, you know, that person, he told me that I was going to marry somebody named Michelle. And I married Michelle 20 years later. How did they know that? Well, if you do that enough times, eventually you're going to get something right. And eventually that one person that you got it right on, you're going to convince them. And they're going to go around and promote you. So anyway, I was kind of disappointed in Bill Maher for being, uh, I don't know, not as sharp as I thought. And on just not on that, on other stuff too. And I'm not talking about politics, just in general, you know, when he says certain things, it's like, I don't know, he sounds sharp dur during the monologue. <laughs> and... That's because it's written ahead of time and you edit things and you know, but when it comes to this kind of stuff, not that, not that clever. Get rid of some of the dust. But I am a big fan of Penn and Teller. Um, I've seen many, many shows of theirs live. I've met them after the show a few times, quite a, all the time actually. I've taken pictures with them. First time I, I took a picture was not with uh, Penn, it was with Teller. And then after that I took a few with, uh, with Penn. And then I took a couple with Teller. So, but I haven't seen them in, I don't know, how many years now? Probably six, seven years. I enjoy magic, and I'm very curious when I see a trick and I, I can't figure it out. I'm always curious, and then when I, I research it and I find out how the trick is done, ten times out of nine I'm disappointed, which means always disappointed. I'm always disappointed when I figure out a trick, or when I, I find a place that shows me how the trick was done, I go, that is how it was done, because when you don't know. You know, most people's mind, when they don't know how that kind of stuff happens, immediately goes to the supernatural. Immediately. And that's not the place you ought to go immediately or ever. Because, I don't know, like, for me, every time I look at things like that, there's always a logical explanation, always. And it never is ghosts it's never psychics remember when i was younger i would hear stories that the police department could not solve a murder and then eventually they went to a, a psychic and then the murder was solved and i want to say of those stories 99.9999999999 percent of them are false the police department did not go to a psychic that would be like a waste of taxpayer dollars and not only that the psychic's not going to tell you anything except uh, i see a big body of water 
and that kind of nonsense because most bodies that people you know people when they kill dispose of uh, they dispose of them in places where there's murky ponds and rivers and the ocean and things like that so they always say i see water and then they'll give you an in general or an ambiguous location and then if the police find something they'll pull out that ambiguous thing and say that's that's what i said that's what i was talking about psychics are the biggest frauds you know biggest frauds out there I have no idea how they get away with it, where they can take your money fraudulently and then, you know, and I'm, I'm not talking about you went and paid them $50, I'm talking about these uh, psychics that tell you if you want to hear more, I need another $1,000 or whatever, and then they end up ripping you off as an old person, I'm talking about these old people that go and they want to find out things from the future. Um, I'm surprised that, you know, it's not illegal to do that. They say, oh, it's only entertainment. That's how they get away with it. But if you if you think psychics are real, I don't know what to tell you. You know, you're, you're being gullible. Just fraud. So we apply some of this Shoe cream. And then let it dry. And then use the uh, brush and take it off. Take the uh, that dusty layer off and shine them up. Give them a nice shine. I am a big fan of Houdini. Huge fan of Houdini. I'm also a big fan of Cardini. Big fan of Cardini. Oh, look at that. Look at that. You know what that needs? Tide. I bet it happens. You'd be surprised how many people buy into the psychic nonsense and they get hooked and they want to know what's going to happen, what's going to happen in the future, what's going to happen in the future, and they end up, they blow all this money on somebody who's lying to them. And then, you know, they'll walk away and they'll say, well, how did they know this and how did they know that? I don't know how, did they, how they knew all that, you know, I mean, I know stuff too by guessing. You know, like I said, 2% of the time, I'm correct too. Not that impressive, you know. And like I said, if if you have a, a big enough sample of people that go to psychics, you're going to have certain people that heard something that was fascinating to them and it turned out to be true. Not because a psychic knew this to happen in the future, but because they're just throwing things at you. A lot of it's cold reading, <laughs> where you supply enough information to the psychic and then they basically give it back to you and you think that they originated the information not impressed by that stuff at all all right getting a little dark here All right, one down. Then they have these. I, I don't remember what they call these. I knew at one point, because I looked it up, but I don't remember now what these are called. They go in the front here. They're false tongues. I don't know what they I'll put a little bit of polish on these. Let them dry. There's nothing more <clears throat> satisfying than wearing leather boots 
that are that are broken in that are broken in they feel very good I mean I've I've had canvas before shoes like that and they don't break in the right way like these right now when I put them on and I tighten up the laces they feel so good feel so good when you walk Went bowling yesterday um, <laughs> with my kids, and I want to say that the um, the two hand approach, the two hand bowling approach, you know, where they grab and they use both hands, is gaining popularity. When I was a kid and I would go bowling, nobody would use two hands to bowl with unless you were a little kid and you were rolling it like that. But now I go and I see. You know, four or five people, you, you know, they're bowling that way. I haven't tried it yet. You know, I'm not, you know, a superstar at bowling. But I enjoy hitting the pins. And I'm, I'm trying to... I'm trying to get good at the hook. You know, where it goes, starts off, because I'm righty. Starts off on the right, and then by the time it gets all the way down, and it's getting ready to hit... It rotates and hits the middle pin, so it hooks. I'm trying to get that down. But it's enjoyable. I used to bowl quite often when I was a kid. And then I stopped abruptly. I don't know what happened. I just stopped. And decades went by because time goes on and I didn't do it and then I ended up going with a friend of mine and we did it for a bit again and then a long time went you know a couple of decades passed after that and then most recently I just did it again so you know I'm not I'm not a guy who goes and practices or I haven't been doing it for years I'm kind of new at it even though I bowled in the past but I've allowed so much time to go by that um I could have been better now, had I gone more often in the past. But I, I enjoy the sound, I enjoy the ball, I like watching the ball. Every once in a while I'll get a bit of a hook, and you see the ball going this way, but the, um, the rotation is this way. So eventually, by the time it gets to the end, it grips, and then it'll, it'll squish. And I like, I like um, Belmonte, Belmont Jason from Australia he's a two-handed bowler um, but I, I really like uh, what's his name there Pete uh, what's his last name Weber you know that edgy guy always talking always angry I think now he's doing the senior league thing but up until a few years ago he was one of the top bowlers in the entire universe All right. Now you know what this smells like. It smells like like uh, shaving cream. I also do the uh, the heel because. You don't want to have the rest of the shoe brown and shiny and the heel look like you walk through some uh, patches of salt. But it actually smells like I shaved. All right, now. Made a little bit of a mess here, but that's okay. I'll wash it up. <clears throat> I 
I remember years ago there was a, <clears throat> a show called That's Incredible. I love that show. I used to watch it every, I think it was Fridays, Friday or Saturday, I think Friday would come on and they would show you something and they would say, that's incredible, the audience. So they had Frank, what was his name, Tarkenton? And then you had, what was the other one, Sarah Edwards or Sarah Lee, I don't know what, they had that blonde female, uh, Sarah, I don't know, something like that, I remember her. And then uh, they had the other guy, John Davidson with the hair. And he could sing, you know, and he was on Hollywood Squares. And I liked him. And I'll tell you why. He, he would call out the cons. You know, the uh, BS guys. And so they had a guy one time who was on That's Incredible. And he claimed, as another hoax, <laughs> that he could move objects using his... his mind what do they call that telekinesis um, so he was like concentrating on a pencil and the pencil moved and the uh, Frank guy was astonished I think a little bit he was like wow that's amazing and then um, John da John Davidson jumps in and he goes I felt you blow on that he goes I you know he he goes you 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 blew on that so I guess he was blown out of his nose or out of his mouth in a way that wasn't visible but John Davidson, who was next to him, figured out the scam. And he called him out on it and embarrassed him. And I was very happy he did that because all these guys, they're just con men. You know, they they you know, they fool the gullible and they make you think that they're actually using their mind to move something without touching it. Like watch the pencil, watch the pencil. It's like that other guy, Yuri Geller. Another BS guy, another BS artist. He's uh, doing the spoon thing. That spoon trick, that spoon trick is one of the oldest tricks. You could buy that at a joke shop. It's very easy to do, nothing, you know. And then I remember one time, many, many years ago, he had a special on, Yuri Geller special. And what he was gonna do is he was gonna do some kind of psychic power stuff in your house through the television, right? So, and this is like a ridiculous trick for obvious reasons, but he said that I want you to find something in your house that doesn't work, that you know doesn't work, and I'm gonna make it work, whether it's a clock or something that's been broken for years. Now keep in mind, there's millions of people watching this show, it was live, millions of people. So, out of that percentage, you're gonna grab something that you thought was broken, like a watch that stopped working or something like that. And then you're gonna you're gonna test it now, years later. You're gonna be like, wow, it works now. Yuri Geller made it work. No, he didn't make it work. He didn't make it work at all. It's just that that thing worked anyway, and now you not knowing that it worked anyway, pulled it out and you're giving him credit for it. I mean, I've had things like that. I've had a camera one time, um, it wasn't working. And I put it aside. A few years later, I was messing with it again, and it was working. You know, maybe it was damp, it dried out, or whatever. Many explanations. Watches sometimes stick. Then years go by, you, you know, screw around with it, and all of a sudden it's working again. It's not any kind of power. All right. I don't know what's going on with him these days, but yeah, he was always into that nonsense, trying to fool people. And he knew, obviously, he knew he was fooling people, but he was, you know, adamant about, oh no, it's really happening through the, you know, supernatural thing that I'm, I'm causing it to happen. No, you're not. All right. Anyway, I will be uh, back in a few minutes to shine up the boots. I want to get some water. All right, I am back. Got a little bit of water here and uh, a little bit of rubbing alcohol to get rid of the um, the dye from the table here.
you know I think if I if I use uh, I think if I use rubbing alcohol on my shirt it'll spread it and make it worse so I'll leave that for now refreshing I mean I have um, I have lacquer thinner that I could use to take the stuff comes off with lacquer thinner paint thinner takes it off acetone will take it off rubbing alcohol takes it right off but I feel if I if I use it here It'll smudge it. All right. Yeah, we'll wash them too, you know, not. Because rubbing alcohol removes the paint, but it doesn't remove the grime. I used to get that mechanic soap, you know, that that soft, uh, I don't know, they make it out of petroleum products in there with, uh, you know, some of it smells really nice. Then they get the other, the orange Gojo. That's not, that's good, but it's not as good as the other stuff. The other stuff is like magic. You know, you're a mechanic or something and uh, you're working all day with that. Take some of that stuff, rub it in nice for, you know, four or five minutes. And then don't rinse it. Take a nice rough cloth and take the cloth and, and remove it with the cloth. And then that removes all the grease from the nooks and crannies and your fingerprints and everything cleans out. So, I'll give you an example. So I knew somebody who worked at a gas station and their hands were spotless, like clean. You didn't notice any kind of, you know, like groove darkness in there with the uh, old grease getting in and not being able to get out with using conventional cleaning means. And yeah, his hands were, were clean, like he was a, a tailor instead of a mechanic. So one day I watched him, what was the secret? And that was a secret. So he would use that mechanic uh, cream soap, rub it in nice, you know, sometimes he would do it twice, depends. And then instead of rinsing them with water, he would take a towel or something and then he would, you know, take all that stuff off with a towel. And that would remove all the grease. So his hands would look super clean. And then after that, he would go and wash them with regular soap. So he would get rid of that petroleum smell. Because he was telling me one time he ran to somebody, he's like, don't you wash your hands? And he's like, well, I'm a mechanic. He's like, well, I'm a mechanic too. At that point, he should have said, maybe you're not a good mechanic like me because I'm busier than you. But he didn't say that. He just listened to him and he goes, well, why don't you clean them this way? Everybody's got something to teach you. So we listen. All right, now. I'd rather stand up when I do this, but it's all right. You know, I'm a big fan of shining the shoes. First of all, they last longer. Uh, they don't crack up on you. So when they break in, you know, they, they will last much longer because of the lubricants and all that nice stuff in there. The only problem is that the bottoms wear out. Well, these, these bottoms are solid. I don't really notice much of a difference. These are very heavy duty, the bottoms. But my other ones, my, my, um, my Georgia boots, the smaller ones, if you flip them upside down, you'll notice that the bottoms are gone. I mean, there's still, you know, a good amount of uh, rubber, but the grooves are flattened.
So I ended up getting my daughter um, Atari, the retro version. So in the old days when I had Atari, when I was a kid, you had to go and buy each individual cartridge on its own. And I don't know, back then it was like, what, 25, 30, 40 bucks each one. And, and then you have a stack, you know, I, only, I had a few. And uh, I think Space Invaders came with uh, came with the game, with the uh, machine. And I had Space Invaders, I had Missile Command, I had um, <clears throat> Asteroids, I had Superman, and I had Adventure. I love playing Adventure. I mean, I look at it now because we were playing Adventure this morning, and I go, these graphics are ridiculous. For a sword to kill the dragons, first of all, the dragons are ridiculous. But the sword is an arrow, and you are a, um, a square. And you hook up to the arrow, and then there's a bat in the higher levels that steals things on you. Um, and then the, the dragons become three, they get more and more aggressive, and um, then there's a bridge that looks like two lines that you can cross over things. Very primitive, but back then when I had it, I was fascinated with the whole maze thing, and I would sit. I'd get home from school, I'd open up the windows because I always loved the nice, cool breeze coming in. And back then, my father would buy something called Flaky Puffs. And they came in strawberry and chocolate flavors, so I would grab the, you know, depending on how I felt, but usually I'd grab the chocolate. All right, I am back. I had a, uh, an interruption, so that's why there's an edit here. It's only a few minutes later. It's not like it's like, you know, 10 years later, but had a little interruption. So anyway. Yeah, my shoes uh, have a little bit of a shaving cream, fresh smell. You know, I, I use, uh, what's that one called? The, uh, so really like the top one there. I have it inside, I didn't use it for my boots. I use that more for dress shoes. Um, but this one here is a good cream as well. Would I put it? I brought it inside. Um, but the other one has a, like a, it's a, it's a good aroma. I don't know how they make these things to smell that way. But the cheap, cheap one, which also shines your shoes if you want to use it, but it contains a lot of petroleum uh, products in it. Kiwi. Kiwi is uh, the old-fashioned, the old days. You run into somebody who's like in their 80s, they, they always mention kiwi. Get some kiwi. But I've used them all. I use them all. They're all, you know, they're all decent when it comes to the shine. The only difference is the price, I think. Although the one that, uh, what is the name of it? Let me see. I will look it up because, uh, you know, I use it on my dress shoes. And sometimes I use it on my boots as well, but. Let me see here. Ah, uh, here it is. Sapphire. Uh, in case I'm mispronouncing it, S-A, I was going to say F. Let's do over there. S-A-P-H-I-R. That company. Sapphire. 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 Anyway, uh, that one is exceptional. That's a good brand. You pay for, you know, you pay for it, but... You know, a little goes a long way, but I have all their products. When I go and I see it somewhere, I, I will buy it. And mainly I have uh, brown and black for colors. I don't really have shoes that are different. But this one here, I've used Cadillac. Not bad. Um, you know, I've, I've gone through different brands throughout the years. And, you know, I stick with the ones that 
I think, do the best job. But the sapphire, a sapphire, that one is the best one that I've used. I think it's made in France. All right. Nice. Now we get to this one. Getting a little hungry. So. I shine them up and um, the next day I go out to the desert and within five minutes it looks like I never shined them up but there's something psychological uh, psychologically appealing uh, psychologically satisfying to me when your shoes are fresh you know they're nice and clean and then you know yeah they're gonna get dirty again but when I go out in the morning I want them to be shiny and then yeah they get dirty because I go into the uh, dirt that's how it works then I come back a lot of times I will clean it with saddle soap remove the lather let them dry completely and then polish them uh, sometimes I add a little bit of uh, lubricant if I feel that the leather's a little bit dry, it's not, but if it is, I add it. Especially dress shoes, but for me, I wear boots a lot, and I really appreciate a shiny boot. It makes me feel like I walk better when it's shiny. You know, when I'm walking far and I look down and my, my boots are dusty, I get a little bit annoyed. A little bit annoyed. So, what I do is I let them sit for a few minutes and then I will go over them again. So I, we have these things here, which I have to look up again. I know there's a lot of people that know the name and I should, I should remember, but I don't use the word that often. And it's kind of new to me because uh, I don't know. I don't know what they call these spare tongues. But I put them on, they, they uh, protect the front. All right, dark out. <sighs> you know, one thing I don't notice, fireflies. One of those things, nice hot summer night out in the backyard when you're a kid, maybe 
your parents are doing a little bit of barbecuing on the side there. But I remember being out in the backyard and at around 9.30 or so when it would be, you know, dark out, the fireflies would show up and we'd chase them around. I don't know, here I don't see fireflies. I don't know what the problem is. And they're a cool little thing, you know, I remember I always want to, you know, capture like a hundred of them and put them in a jar and then go in a dark room and watch the light. But I never did that. Nope, there's one of the little cats. Yeah, that one is the friendliest. That one comes by, it'll, you know, rub up against my leg or something. Oh, there it is. One thing about cats, they don't they don't care if you're gone. Uh, when, yeah, they get hungry, they care, but you know, a dog is totally different. A dog is very excited to see you. You come back from a trip, vacation, whatever, and um, the dog sees you and it's, you know, jumping for joy. A cat, uh, couldn't care less, you know, it's like, oh, you're back, okay. That's the nature of how they are. Now I'll just go over a little bit. I have my jeans on the washing machine, all of them, well, I don't put too many because then, you know, they don't get, they don't get as clean as they should if you put, uh, you know, like seven, eight pairs in there. I do three at a time, three at a time, plenty of room, I add Tide, and then uh, I'll do a double or triple rinse, make sure all that soap is out, and then I dry them. In the old days, I, I would have a clothesline right here, and I would get up after you know the uh, machine would finish cleaning, and then I would take the, uh, what do they call those things, the uh, clothespins, I don't use those anymore, and I would sit here and I'd hang up like 30 pieces of clothing, and then they would dry. I don't know anybody who hangs their clothes up. I remember when I was a kid, I would, I would um, be in my parents' car, my father would be driving the station wagon, the thumb was always like this, always doing this. I said to my father, why don't you just hold it steady? Why do you keep doing this thing? And my father said, well, <clears throat> when I'm driving, I notice the car go a little bit right and I correct it. Then I notice it go to the left, I correct it. I go, you're constantly doing that. He goes, well, it constantly needs correction. And back then, the, the steering wheels were loose. Now they're nice and tight like sports cars. So anyway, we would drive through the city, and in those days, the old part of town, you could see the back part of the houses of the apartments, and everybody, and I mean everybody, had a clothesline. Everybody. And a lot of times you would see, like, all the clothes from one side to the other, 60 feet of clothesline with, like, you know, shirts, pants, underwear, all that stuff hanging outside. Now, I don't know, I don't see anybody hanging clothes on a clothesline. Mama's boy going home. All right, this one is done. This one is done. Yeah. And then we put the laces on and then tomorrow we wear these.
All right. <clears throat> That's it. And tomorrow, uh, they'll be dusty and uh, they, uh, they will need to be refurbished. This is refurbishing. Okay, that's it. That's it, capiche? Ciao for now.